For the dedication of the new wall of Jerusalem, the Levites throughout the land were asked to come to Jerusalem to assist in the ceremonies. They were to take part in the joyous occasion with their songs of thanksgiving and with the music of cymbals, harps, and lyres. I led the leaders of Judah to the top of the wall and organized two large choirs to give thanks. One of the choirs proceeded southward along the top of the wall to the Dung Gate. The second choir, giving thanks, went northward around the other way to meet them. The two choirs that were giving thanks then proceeded to the temple of God, where they took their places. So did I, together with the group of leaders who were with me. Many sacrifices were offered on that joyous day, for God had given the people cause for great joy. The women and children also participated in the celebration, and the joy of the people of Jerusalem could be heard far away. On that same day as the book of Moses was being read to the people, the passage was found that said no Ammonite or Moabite should ever be permitted to enter the assembly of God. For they had not provided the Israelites with food and water in the wilderness. Instead, they had hired Balaam to curse them, though our God turned the curse into a blessing. When this passage of the law was read, all those of foreign descent were immediately excluded from the assembly. I also discovered that the Levites had not been given their prescribed portions of food, so that they and the singers who were to conduct the worship services had all returned to work their fields. I immediately confronted the leaders and demanded, why has the temple of God been neglected? Then I called all the Levites back again and restored them to their proper duties. And once more, all the people of Judah began bringing their tithes of grain, new wine, and olive oil to the temple storerooms. In those days, I saw men of Judah treading out their wine presses on the Sabbath. They were also bringing in grain, loading it on donkeys, and bringing their wine, grapes, figs, and all sorts of produce to Jerusalem to sell on the Sabbath. So I rebuked them for selling their produce on that day. I confronted the nobles of Judah. Why are you profaning the Sabbath in this evil way, I asked. About the same time, I realized some of the men of Judah had married women from Ashdod, Ammon, and Moab. Furthermore, half their children spoke the language of Ashdod or some other people and could not speak the language of Judah at all. So I confronted them and called down curses on them. I beat some of them and pulled out their hair. I made them swear in the name of God that they would not let their children intermarry with the pagan people of the land. So I purged out everything foreign and assigned tasks to the priests and Levites, making certain that each knew his work. I also made sure that the supply of wood for the altar and the first portions of the harvest were brought at the proper times. Remember this in my favor, O oh my God. You know what I miss? I miss the old television shows. Lone Ranger, the old Superman, uh, even Andy Griffith. Each of those shows in a half hour or one hour time would create this plot, this conflict, the whole thing, but it was always resolved within an hour. And I could just let it go and, and oh, that feels good, live happily ever after. And then, then Batman came along. And I don't know how many of you remember the Batman television but they started this thing where the dastardly deeds that were being done and Batman and Robin were caught in some terrible thing. They're, they're being lowered into a vat of acid or something like that. And then the show was over and it left you hanging. And it's like, oh no, what's going to happen? Batman and Robin are going to die. And then in the next show, of course, Batman would pull it out somehow and, and, and it would go on. And then today... I mean, these shows run. It's not just like left hanging until the next show. They go for the whole season. They go for years. This stuff is never resolved. It just keeps on going. Don't we have enough drama in our lives, folks, that we don't need to vicariously go through all of this stuff too? And I think that's the point is that life doesn't just resolve itself in an hour. But there's this ongoing thing that we live with. Is, it's just, it's not happily ever after. In fact, happily ever after is a fairy tale. It's a myth. We are struggling with life and with people around us and circumstances that come our way. And it's just 
these things don't just neatly tie themselves up and now everything is fine. And this is what we're going to see as we bring our Nehemiah series to a close today. You see, as we've gone through this series in Nehemiah, and Nehemiah, by the way, is a book in the Old Testament, right about in the middle there before Psalms, and, and it's the story of what happened to the people of Israel after they had been in exile for 70 years, and then God began to restore them, and a, re a remnant began to come back to Jerusalem, and they got their temple built. And what we've discovered in this book of Nehemiah, several things here, it starts with someone who's interceding, praying, and, and then he takes action. It's Nehemiah. He's the central character of the book. And then we see they begin to build the walls of Jerusalem and there's coordination and everyone gets involved even amidst opposition from outside. And then there's that oppression and intimidation, the bullies around us, and, and they work through that. And then as the walls are built, the word of God is read and the revelation comes to the people and they begin to confess, the confession. And then finally there's some resolution and, and they become resolute in this and they make their commitment to God and it wasn't just say, hey, yeah, we'll go with that God, but I mean, they spelled it out and they signed their names on the line saying, we are committing to that. And today we're going to look at the final two themes in the final two chapters of Nehemiah. It talks about celebration and confrontation. So here we are incredible things have happened. Nehemiah came, Jerusalem and its walls were in ruins. And it's just extraordinary how the people all got together and they built the walls. Now, how many of you are builders out here? You've worked with concrete block and put it up, all right? That's not the walls they built. What we're going to see in the celebration is they actually went up on the walls with choirs and they walked on them. These were major things that they did. The walls were very thick and, and made of all these big stones. And, and there's going to be this huge celebration. So there's this long list of priests and Levites with their, their duties for this big dedication that's going to take place. And, and it's this big celebration. You know, we need to celebrate good things, don't we? How many of you have ever been to a baptism service here at Life 360? Okay, that's what I think of. We have this big tank right down here in the front, and, and, and the people are being baptized, and when they come out of the water, we're celebrating, we're clapping, it's a joyous thing because when big things happen, we need to celebrate. And that's what's happening in Nehemiah, is that this is huge, what God has done. The walls have been built, and now the dedication of this new wall of Jerusalem, and there's all these people that are brought together, so they get the folks from the out outlying settlements and they bring them all in especially the Levites and the priests and they are going to take part in this joyous occasion they have trumpets they have cymbals they have harps they have lyres there are singers that are brought in and there are two large choirs that are put together and they are going to march opposite directions up on top of the wall and then make their way to the temple and at the temple there are all kinds of sacrifices being made and there is great Joy, Even the women and children, it isn't just for the men. The women and children get in to this joyful time, and it says that it could be heard far away. And not just that, they have now organized and set up for the ongoing worship of the temple. And so the Levites are there. People have their duties and what they're supposed to do, and people are going to bring their tithes so that there is enough to do the work. And then they come to the book of Moses and they're going to read the book of Moses again. And it's interesting that as they read the book of Moses this time, they discover in the book of Moses, this is the law now, the, the, the book of the law. And they discover that something had happened when the children of Israel had left Egypt and were making their way to the promised land. And there are these two nations, Ammon and Moab, the Ammonites and the Moabites, and they would not let them pass through. They would not share food with them. And so it was said that the Ammonites and the Moabites were never to be allowed into the assembly. And so the people at that moment when they heard this, they said, okay, this is the law. And so they excluded foreigners 
from the assembly. Now, it didn't mean foreigners couldn't live in Jerusalem. It didn't mean that they couldn't be around. It just meant in the religious things that they were doing at the temple, foreigners were excluded. So what a great day this was. A great celebration. And my question is this, shouldn't this be where the book of Nehemiah ends? The people came together, everyone worked, the wall was built, opposition, oppression, intimidation, they were all overcome, the word of God was read and taught, the people responded with confession, with resolution, with commitment. There was this great celebration as the wall was dedicated, and like those early TV shows, it's all neatly wrapped up in 12 chapters, and the people now can live happily ever after. But wait, there's chapter 13. I don't know how many of you are writers, and if you write a book, there's certain things you want to include in the way you do it, and apparently Nehemiah didn't get that message because after all of this great climactic, you know, he reached the celebration and all the things that had happened. And it's like chapter 13 comes along and going, what in the world, Nehemiah? What are you bringing all this stuff up for now? And what I would say to you is uh, because the Bible deals with real life. It's not about fantasy and fairy tales. It's about where we really live. And this is Nehemiah's life and the things that he's dealing with. And so now, after the celebration, all of these great things, instead of closure, what we find is that life goes on and we're dealing with confrontation. So Nehemiah, if you look at the history, had come to Jerusalem about 444 BC, before Christ. That was the 20th year of Artaxerxes, who was the king of Persia. After 12 years in Jerusalem, so now we're down to 432 BC, in the 32nd year of the king's reign, he returns to Persia because his job in Persia had been to be the cupbearer for the king. You remember that from chapter 1 of Nehemiah. And after a season that he's there, we're figuring about two years, now Nehemiah comes back to Jerusalem. He's appointed the governor. That's what he was for 12 years. Is gone for a couple of years or a period of time. And now he comes back. And here's where we pick up in chapter 13. The people have gone back on their commitment to God and the law. What? They wrote their names. They signed it. They confessed. God did this great thing. And what? They go back on it. And, and so chapter 13 begins to list the things they did. You heard Nathaniel read some of these things and Nehemiah's reaction. So Eliashib, he's the high priest. And he let Tobiah, the Ammonite, have a room in the temple. He sets him up in probably multiple rooms. The guy's living in the temple, he's got his own room there. And what is, ne Nehemiah comes back and he says, what? And so he just goes in and he starts throwing Tobiah's stuff out. He just tosses it out. He calls the priest to come and cleanse this place. Let's clean this place up, whether we're sweeping it out or ceremonially cleansing it. But it's time for this to go. Remember, the book of the law said Ammonites and Moabites aren't to be part of the assembly. They can't be there in the temple. Secondly, the people had stopped bringing the tithe to the storehouse. Maybe that's why there was room for Tobiah to have a room in that storeroom. There wasn't anything there. And so the Levites, who, by the way, depended on the tithes of the people to be able to survive, there weren't tithes coming in, so they went back to their farms where they could live. And Nehemiah says, this has got to change. And so he appoints honest men to distribute the tithes to the Levites. And people begin to bring their tithes again. The third thing, Nehemiah, I, like Nehemiah don't leave for two years. Because you come back and everything's falling apart. The people are desecrating the Sabbath. Have you ever heard of the Sabbath? On the seventh day, God rested. And so it's holy to the Lord. 
and there are people who are tromping out their wine presses. There are people who are buying and selling, and, and then there's uh, foreigners that are coming with fish and all kinds of merchandise, and they're being sold on the Sabbath. I mean, this is a big deal. And so Nehemiah commands that the gates of Jerusalem are going to be shut on Friday as the sun goes down. That's the beginning of the Sabbath, all the way until the sun goes down on Saturday. And there's not going to be any more desecration of the Sabbath. And then finally, the fourth thing that he mentions is that people were intermarrying with pagans. I mean, to the point, and you heard what he said, you know, their children don't even know our language. It's all getting mixed up. And I know we live in America. We're a melting pot, aren't we? And so we don't think anything of it. But understand in that time, this was the Jewish people, the Israelites, and this was a very religious thing for them to remain pure and separate. Otherwise, their nation would cease to exist. And remember what Mark Fabian had taught us in, in weeks, uh, last week is that marriage wasn't just like, well, I fell in love with this girl, and I'm sorry, she's an Ammonite, you know, but we're in love. It it's, wasn't about that, but there were all kinds of economic alliances and influences and things going on, and, and they were, they were uh, not just having influence from their side, but from the other side and influences on the whole thing. And so here's Nehemiah's reaction. He says, so I confronted them. We, we just heard this. I got, I got to read it to you again. And called down curses on them. My goodness. I beat some of them. <laughs> and I pulled out their hair. I made them swear in the name of God that they would not let their children intermar intermarry with the pagan people of the land. These are the very things that the people had committed to. They had signed on the dotted line saying, these are the laws that we're going to live by. We're going to be faithful to them and we're going to write our John, John Hancock on this paper as a memorial saying, this is what we're going to do. The final words of Nehemiah then come to us. He says, so I purged out everything foreign and assigned tasks to the priests and Levites, making certain that each knew his work. I also made sure that the supply of wood for the altar and the first portions of the harvest were brought at the proper times. And he says, remember this in my favor, O oh my God. And that's how the book ends. What? <laughs> it should have ended with the celebration. But this is true life, folks. The people, for all their commitment, had gone back on it. And so we come to the end of the book of Nehemiah. In fact, this is also the end of the Old Testament. There were contemporaries like Malachi the prophet, but this is where the Old Testament ends. From the creation story of Genesis that tells us also about the fall of man, we see a God who seeks to redeem human beings. And so he chooses a people through whom to work. He gives them his laws. He makes them into a nation. He continue calls them, continually calls them back to him and to his ways. And finally... When they leave him and they give in to idolatry and all the things that he had warned them about and the nations around them, he thrusts them from his presence into exile in Babylon with this promise of a remnant that will return. And as we have seen in the book of Nehemiah, even when the people return, and the temple is restored, and the walls of Jerusalem are rebuilt, and the people hear the book of the law, and they respond with deep and sincere commitment to God and to the law. After all that God has done for them, they still can't keep their commitment to him. And the Israelites continue to languish under the control of the Persians, and after that, the Greeks 
and finally the Romans for the next 400 years. And in A.D. 70, 70 years after Christ was born, the Romans finally leveled the temple and destroyed Jerusalem, and the nation of Israel ceased to exist for 2,000 years until about 74 years ago in modern history, in 1948, when the nation of Israel was reborn. These are the people that we're talking about here in, in Nehemiah. As he's calling them back, but they keep leaving their commitment. They can't seem to hang in there with God. Even after all that he had done, they had Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They had all the prophets. They had their kings. God worked powerfully among them, and it came to this. And I would suggest to you today that this is the enduring message of the Old Testament. No matter how hard we try, no matter how much we sincerely commit, or how well we know the law of God, we will continue to fail and fall back because this is the condition of the sinful human heart. And you might be sitting here today and you say, I'm going to live for God. I'm going to really go for it. And I, I applaud that. Give it your all. But you need to hear what the Word of God teaches. Because in the Old Testament, we learn that even though they had all of these things, I mean, what more can God do to make things clear than to have someone come down from the mountain with the tablets and say, here it is. They can't claim ignorance. This is a matter of the heart. And it's still that way today. How many times have we seen someone that we care about begin to get their life together only to fall back into their old lifestyle that is destroying them and their family. Like Nehemiah, we want to call down curses on them. We want to punch them. And we want to pull out their hair and say, well, what are you doing? You made this commitment. You were on the right road, and now you're just going to give it all up? You know what I'm talking about, don't you? But listen to this. How many times have I not kept my commitment to God? And I want to call down curses on me, and I want to punch me. Why did you do that again? Why, why don't you just shut your mouth and pull out my hair? Because we are human beings and we keep failing. It's not about how hard we're going to try. I'm really going to do it this January with my New Year's resolutions until the second week in January. <laughs> you know, it's, it's just this frustration that we feel. And here is the point, everyone that the word of God is trying to say to us and was saying to the people of the Old Testament and now into the New Testament, we need a Savior. Yeah. That's it. We need a Savior. The Jews knew this, and they looked for the day when Messiah would come and make things right. They knew they, they needed something more than just the law and our own commitment. We're going to try to stick with it. Because even Nehemiah, if he's gone two years, everything goes to pot. The only thing is that the Jews thought Messiah would come and rule with an iron fist. And force everyone finally to conform to the law of God. And whoever was over them at that point, in Jesus' day, it was the Romans. When Messiah comes, boy, those Romans, we're going to kick them out. And when Messiah did come, about 400 years later, after Nehemiah, he didn't come to force people to do anything. He came calling them to trust him. We call it faith. Jesus, Messiah, didn't work on human beings from the outside in, but rather he worked on them from the inside out. He went deep to deal with the root cause of sin, which is the sinful human heart. 
No amount of commitment or effort on our part was going to fix that. Something needs to change inside of us, not rules from the outside trying to squeeze us into that mold, but something that changes on the inside so that we can finally go with it. And so Jeremiah, who's from the Old Testament, could see that by the Spirit of God when he wrote, this is the new covenant I will make with my people on that day, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. There is finally the solution. That's what we need. We need someone to make us new. Jesus said it this way, you must be born again. You can't just fix up this old thing. Something new has to come. Paul writes on the same vein and he says, you're going to be a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. We need a savior. And Jesus is that savior. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Oh, well, no one? Only you, Jesus? Aren't there many ways to God? And Jesus says, there's just one way. There's a Savior. Jesus is that Savior. He says, it's through me. Peter and John stood before the Jewish leaders, the same leaders who had condemned Jesus to death, and they declared, there is salvation in no one else. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. <laughs> it's just Jesus. So are there many saviors? Oh, there's a lot of people that can help us. Sure, people can help you, but there's only one savior, capital S. And that is Jesus. So I ask you, how is it that Jesus is our savior? Well, let me just give you three ways that Jesus saves us. You say, I didn't know I need to be saved. Well, come on, look at your life. <laughs> look, at the, look at our world. You just try to be good for a while, and you'll find out real quick, you need help. You need a Savior. So how is Jesus our Savior? Well, first of all, he has saved us from the penalty of our sin. You see, Jesus paid it all. When he went to the cross, to die, he paid for all the messed up things that we have done and that we're going to do. He paid it all. There's nothing left to pay. He said it is finished. He saves completely. And so all of God's wrath that justly belongs on us, and by the way, the wages of sin is death. That's what we deserve. And Jesus just turned it all aside. It was coming to us. He turned it aside. He says, I'm going to take it all on me. And that's why he died on the cross. That's why he suffered. That's why he went through all of this. This perfect man, by the way, the only perfect human being who has ever lived in all the history of the world. That was Jesus. And what did we do to him? Well, we killed him. Well, we can't have that. And so he died to pay the penalty for your sin and for mine. And he said this, if you will trust him, believing that he died on the cross for you and that he rose on the third day, you can be saved. You can be saved. He paid the debt. And if you ever get a speeding ticket, okay, not a single hand went up. God, God help us with lying here, you know. It's like, and, and you go and you got to pay the fine and you walk in. The judge said, well, someone paid it for you. What? Well, do I have to? No, it's all paid. Well, what am I supposed to do? It's all paid. It's done. That's what Jesus did. He saves us from the penalty of our sin. But number two, he is saving us from the power of sin. And this is really where we're at. And as we look at Nehemiah and these people who made the commitment, and then they go back on it, it's like they can't help themselves. What's wrong with the high priest, Eliashib? <laughs> An Ammonite living in the temple? What's wrong with you, buddy? So Jesus is saving us from the power of sin. Salvation's not just a ticket to heaven, folks. Oof, I'm going in. I'll live however I want here. At least I know I, when I die, I'm going to heaven. That's not what salvation is all about. There's this 
thing that happens while we're still living here. Sin destroys our lives. Have you seen what it does to our children? Have you seen what it does to our families and our marriages and our workplace and our nation and to the world? Sin is terrible. And Jesus, who is the Savior, is saving us from the power of sin. He's saving us now, setting us free from the tyranny of sin. And so when we are born again into Christ, he begins to live in us and we begin to walk in his spirit. That's the only way that the change can really happen. Otherwise, we're just on good days, we're sticking with our commitment. And then all those other days that aren't so good, we're blowing it again. And so the power of God is at work in us because it's in the life of Christ. So this is the answer to the Old Testament problem of falling away. It's not based in our efforts, but on God's power to transform us. By the way, this is good news. That's what it was called, the good news, the gospel. Because finally there's a way for this to happen. Hebrews talks about entering into God's rest Rest from what? From trying so hard, trying to be good. Now we can let God work in us and finally just rest in who he is. So Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll do what? I will give you rest. Yes. So God is working in us. It's his power at work in us. Philippians, Paul writes in chapter 2, God, for God is working in you, so who's doing the work? God's working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. Now put that back with Nehemiah, you know, that's not what was going on there. It was Nehemiah punching people and pulling out their hair, get back in line again. And now in the New Testament, we have a Savior. And through him comes this power of God to finally allow us to live for God. And it comes from our heart, not out of fear of punishment. Because remember, the first thing Jesus did when he saved us was to remove the punishment, remove the penalty. And so we have that he has saved us from the penalty of our sin. Now he is saving us from the power of sin. And praise God, one day he will save us from the presence of sin. For those of us who are in Christ, when we die or when Jesus returns, whichever happens first, sin will no longer have any sway or influence over us. And I'm telling you, Sin is anything that's outside of God's will. It's sin. Okay? It's to miss the mark. This is what God wants. We miss it. That's called sin. When everything is in God's will, that will be heaven. Literally. That will be heaven. Where God rules and reigns. Absolutely. That's how Jesus is our Savior. So the Apostle Paul, who grappled with these issues in chapter 7 of Romans, by the way, you should read the book of Romans sometime. It talks about all of this. And in chapter 7, Paul writes about this frustration of wanting to do what is right, but always falling short. He says, the things I want to do, I don't do. And the things I don't want to do, these I keep on doing. Any of you relate? And so he writes, what a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? And then he answers his question. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. It's through Jesus. Why is it so hard for us to just hang on to that, folks, that we need a Savior? We need a Savior. We'll always need a Savior. And it's Jesus. And my question to you today is, are you ready to be rescued by a Savior? 
And I know there's some of us, hey, I got my life together, no problem. Okay, I'll give you a few years or weeks. But there are other, others of us that we really want to know God. We want to live for Him. We want all the blessings that He has for us. We've seen the mess that we have in our lives. And we see the mess around us. And so if you're here today and never before in your life have you ever thought about, wow, Jesus could be my Savior. He could, like, actually save me. And I could be right with God and my life could have power in it to live for God. And, and, and one day I'll be with Him in, in heaven. And I would like that. And if that's you, today I just want to appeal to you. Trust Him to pay for all you've messed up in your life before God. Just trust Him. Put your faith in Him that, okay, Jesus, you died for me. I'm going to trust that that will pay for my sins. Trust him to take your life and make it into what he wanted it to be. Let him rule your life. Now, can you trust him that much to rule your life? And let his life live in you. So instead of you going off, I'm going to grit my teeth, I'm going to do it this time. Just let Jesus in your life and let him begin to live his life through you. And so if I'm talking to you today and you're thinking, wow, I, I've never done that before. I, I never, I've never heard it that way before. I, I, I want a Savior. Then I invite you right now to pray this prayer in your heart with all your being. Just pray this. God, I keep messing up. Even when I keep trying really hard I need a Savior. I am trusting in Jesus to be my Savior. Jesus, come into my life. Make a new creation. Live your life in me. I invite you to rule my life. Jesus, do this by your power. Amen. Now, here's what I believe, if you're sincere in that. God is looking for people like you so that he can do his great work. He cares so much. This is it, folks, the beginning of a new life, a new creation. I'm going to ask all of you to just stand right now, and I'm going to invite our prayer workers to come to the front. And as we move to a conclusion here, if you invited Jesus to be your Savior for the first time, I want you to step out. There are going to be a lot of people moving around. Just step out and come to see one of our prayer workers at the front and tell them, today I've asked Jesus to be my Savior. And talk to them because they did that too. And they want to help you and pray with you. And while people are doing that, if you ask Jesus to be your Savior, you can just come forward right now. But I want to ask the rest of us, are you struggling with your commitment to God? You find yourself keep falling apart like the Israelites did when Nehemiah was gone? Well, you need the Savior, Jesus, at work rescuing your life. And so I invite you to call on him today. His name's Jesus. He is the Savior. Call on him today and say something like this. Save me. I can't do it on my own. Yes. Maybe I've been a Christian 35 years. Great. Say it. Save me. I can't do it on my own. And if that's you today, I also invite you, come and, and meet some of our prayer workers down front. Let them pray with you. Or come and just kneel. Or, or even if you need to, just stay where you are. But would you begin to call out to the Lord? Join with me right now. Let's ask Jesus to be our Savior 
every day, all the time. It's the only way we're going to make it. So, Lord, we just reach out to you and we cry out to you, Lord Jesus. Save us as individuals, but also as a group, a community of believers. We need a Savior. We're always going to need a Savior. It's not about us doing it of our own strength, our own abilities, our own commitment, our own determination. But we need a Savior. We humbly admit that today. And we say, oh, God, save us. Lord, some of us right now, we're thinking of specific areas in our lives where we just keep failing. We just, we do one step forward, but two steps back. And we've been trying to do it on our own. Today, that ends and we say, I need a Savior. Save me. Save me, Lord Jesus. Let your power loose among us, Lord. Let the Holy Spirit fill our lives to direct us, to enable us to live out what you want us to be. Instead of looking to do it ourselves, we come back to you, our Savior. Lord, we thank you for the book of Nehemiah and what those people went through. And thank you, Lord, for chapter 13 of Nehemiah. It didn't seem to fit, and yet now we see it does fit because it teaches us that we can't live in the Old Testament. You've invited us into the new covenant of the New Testament, and it's about a Savior, Jesus. Save us, Lord. I pray, Lord, even this afternoon that you would confirm that you are powerful to save. And some people have been struggling and struggling and struggling are about to give up. Oh Lord, I pray that now they would just give it up to you and that you would be their savior. That you would be their savior. We no longer live in the Old Testament. We are people of the New Testament and our savior is Jesus, is Jesus. And so now, powerful God, I commit these people to you. Be close to them. Fill their hearts and their lives with your presence. May they know their Savior, Jesus, intimately. And may you receive all the glory for what happens in our lives because you were the one who saved us. Bless these folks. Bless our church. And Lord, whatever the works of our hands are, we pray that you would establish them by your power. Because this world needs to hear about the Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Our service has come to a conclusion. You are welcome to linger here and to pray if you want. Others, if you need to go, we're dismissed. God bless you. Have a good afternoon.